This is Internet Marketing. Brought to you by Site Visibility at sitevisibility.co.uk. This is Internet Marketing. Now, before we start today, Site Visibility have recently um, released their 2020 PPC automation guide. It's completely free to download and it's going to help you to get started with each of the new automation settings within Google Ads. So this includes smart bidding, responsive ad testing, dynamic search and some more. The best way to accelerate your PPC growth in 2020 is to start planning today. So download your guide for free at bit.ly, that's B-I-T dot L-Y slash PPC dash automation dash guide. I'll say that again. Bitly, that's B-I-T dot L-Y slash P-P-C dash automation dash guide. Now today I'm joined by Chris Hatherall, Senior Media Consultant at Midnight PR. Chris, how are you? I'm well, thank you very much. Uh, surviving, that's the main thing anyway. Yes. And you're in Brighton, aren't you? Uh, we're in Brighton. Normally I'd say sunny Brighton, a bit overcast today, but uh, still good to be by the seaside and I'm very lucky I live um, uh, in a flat with a view of the sea, so that's, at least that's getting me through the days. That's nice. Our, our Brighton house, you can only see the sea when you're sitting on the loo, but uh, it's still quite nice. <laughs> Any view is better than none. Yeah. Now, today, um, I, I want to talk about uh, top tips for communicating in a crisis in 2020. But before we do that, tell us uh, a little bit about yourself, Chris, and a little bit about uh, Midnight PR. Yeah, so Midnight Communications is a PR based in Brighton, but we we cover we're a national PR company and um, we cover the whole country, uh, and in, in fact we have some clients abroad as well. Um, so we've been going since 1995, and um, probably one of the longest serving PR companies in the region, I should imagine. And uh, ho- hopefully we're doing a great job. Now the whole country is watching press conferences every day. I mean, we get one from the government every day, and, and there are others. How is it going to um, change the way people in business are trained to talk to the media, do you think? Yeah, it's an interesting one. This Because I've worked for, for, for many years before I was at midnight as a journalist. I still work as a journalist and in my spare time now too. Um, and so if, from a professional point of view, it's been really interesting watching all these interviews that are going on almost on a daily basis uh, on television from the government and from all sorts of other agencies as well. Um, and what I've noticed really is that... Um, there's starting to be a bit of change in the way that um, people are expected to communicate these days. Social media has had a huge impact because social media it requires people to have a conversation. And it's created a generation of people who don't just want to be told what to do. They want to have a conversation about it. They want to know why. They want to have a discussion. Mm. And that's a challenge for a government um, when they're effectively in a position where they want to tell people what to do in these difficult times. And what they've done, I think, is that they've tried to move them focus away from politicians by bringing experts into the mix. So when we see those press conferences every day, it's not just the minister who's telling us what to do. He's then bringing, he or she is then bringing in um, experts in their own profession who are being called on to talk to the public and give their own expert profile and and, uh, advice. Mm. So I think that's quite a different thing. That's something we don't, haven't always seen before. And we may well see that that, moves you know in, into business too in terms of a lot of different types of people might be required to talk to the media in future yes yeah, interesting because they're always flanked aren't they by the, the the chief scientific advisor and the somebody from um, public health england normally aren't they yes i mean it's is it's a, it's a clever way in a way because you know whenever a difficult question is asked they can pass it on to an expert to answer instead but it also gives the public more confidence that the person who's talking um, knows what they're talking about um, and that, that their advice is based on expertise, not not on politics. I want to talk about bridging, actually, because it, it's something I didn't know about. I read about it recently. And for years, uh, media training has focused on bridging. So this is the art of sort of a bit like politicians do. <laughs> you hear one one question, but you actually answer another. You, like, you sort of sneak your own message in, sort of regardless of the question. Now... There's a big change there. I guess, is that, be, are people getting wise to that? 
Yeah, I think I think that that's been going on for so long now, and it's actually it's you know I've, I've, I've worked in um, in t- teaching people how to deal with interviews for a long time, and in the past, bridging was one of the real key techniques that was always taught, even even by the the, the media trainers that are hired by the government. But I have a feeling now, really, that it, it's almost had its day. The public have seen through it; they know when a politician is using a bridging technique. To answer a question, to answer the question in their own way, rather than give us a real answer. So, if if somebody, for instance, says, "Can you explain why we don't have enough PPE for mm-hmm. nurses and, and in the NHS?" A politician might say, "Well, I feel the more important question to discuss is is, is something else," and and that's mm-hmm. the way they answer it. And although that's a very useful technique when you ask uh, you are asked a really difficult question, one that you you might find difficult to answer under pressure. It's a useful technique to know, but it doesn't really give the people you are talking to a feeling of confidence in what you're saying. They see through it these days. So the current advice really is you want to try and replace that by just remembering that you're a human being, remembering that you're a normal person talking to normal people. And if there are questions you can't answer because you don't know the answers or because you're not qualified to give the answer, it's perfectly okay to say you can't answer them as long as you can explain to people why and give some people some knowledge about yourself and maybe suggest somebody who would be more appropriate to ask that question. Yeah. It's actually really difficult to do, isn't it, to actually admit that you don't know an answer. But do you some? I mean, can that be used as a sort of... Uh, I mean, some people would argue that that's a sort of very honest, very open and a very brave thing to do. Is that the way you see it? I, I think so. I think what, what the public wants now more than anything is transparency. Mm. They want and they want honesty and transparency in 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 the in the people that they hear from, um, and it's very it, the most difficult people. For, you know, it, for politicians, it's very tough for them to just come out and say they don't know the answer, <laughs> um, especially in a live interview. And, and perhaps that's the that's that's where the politicians are not really being able to move on past that technique. Um, but for most people, if you're a, you know if you're a business person, or even if you any, if you work for one of the emergency services. Um, there are lots of reasons why you might not know an answer, and the best reason, the best way to to tackle it, is to explain exactly why, explain the background, explain why it's so tough, um, f- you know, and why you cannot answer that. And we've spoken about being honest and transparency. I'm just wondering, in your view, Chris, what's the what would one of the biggest trends in modern communication be i mean we hear a lot about empathy obviously transparency in your mind what's the what's the, one of the biggest trends yeah for me for me for me it's empathy yeah it's it's it's, it's that ha- having the ability as a human being to understand how other people feel and to, to think about the people that you're talking to and think how, when i give my message how will they receive it Mm. And how will it make them feel? Um, what impact might it have on them? What questions might they ask afterwards? Um, so it's a very sort of soft skill in, in that sense. It's not the same as um, having this sort of expertise to 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 fight a, a, a nasty journalist uh, in, in a really tough one-on-one interview. It's about having the confidence to be yourself and to show some understanding for the people you're talking to. And there are situations when if you then if you are dealing with a, a really difficult journalist that you can say, hang on, you know, the questions you're answering, asking are not actually fair mm. because, you know, we're dealing here with a situation, for instance, where people are dying and where people are scared and they're nervous. Your questions are not helping what we you know. And, and I think that's a, a, a better way to deal with that kind of those kind of um, conversations. Yeah. And if you look at Matt Hancock this week, you know, in the time that he got it wrong, which where you know he went out with this this sort of narrative around the badges for for those in social care, you know, it wasn't in itself an awful thing to be offering, but in the whole, he what he didn't sit down and consider was how the people he's talking to might feel when that's what he was offering at a time when what they really needed was PPE and help and and for the country to care about them. And I think really, had he put it in that context, maybe he wouldn't have got those nasty front pages you know, about how callous he'd been with, with that particular campaign. Mm. And different politicians are, are dealing with this in different ways. I'd probably say that maybe in terms of the empathy factor, Matt Hancock might be one of the ones that needs a little more coaching on it. Mm. But there are others there are others that do do it better. Dominic Raab yesterday, I, I think when, when he was talking about the numbers, he used 
much different kind of language. He talked about how uh, that every time he he goes to the lectern to read out the toll of of, of how many people have died, that he walks away and he thinks of their sons and daughters going through that right now, their brothers, their sisters, their grandchildren, all those left behind. And that's what drives him to keep going to try and help. So those are the, you know, that's a, a kind of a more honest connecting way of dealing with those kind of questions than always trying to find solutions and then some finding you, you, you're offering the wrong thing. Yeah. Do you know, I, I always say this, I've, I'm very vocal about this, Laurie, but I do think us guys have got a lot to learn from the ladies about empathy. Uh, just, uh, I always get her name, I always pronounce her name wrong. Is it J- Jacinda? Jacinda, uh, Jacinda, yeah. Jacinda, Jacinda the, yeah. The, um, I'm always, I, I fail to come away from seeing her without being incredibly impressed whenever she speaks about anything. Yeah, Jacinda Ardern, she's a New Zealand Prime Minister. And yeah. she she's she's won a lot of plaudits for the way that she's dealt with some difficult events in New Zealand, mm. not not least the, the the attack in Christchurch on on the mosque there. And it's I think it's uh, you know she's she's one that people perhaps should have a look at. You know, look at some of her videos. Um, think how can I replicate the kind of language that she uses? But she's also she's, she's just I don't know she's just got a way about her. And I think that maybe that's the hard part. Not everybody can learn that. She did um, recently a, a video from her own home during the lockdown. And rather than, you know, sat at a desk with a, a suit on, she was, you know, sat up on her couch with her knees up wearing tracksuit, talking to the nation. I'm, you know, saying that I'm I'm in lockdown just like you are. I'm sat at home here on my sofa yeah. and I know how you all feel. Um, so that's, you know, to have the confidence to do that, you know, sat there, you know, informal no makeup in her own home in tracksuit tracks tracksuit bottoms you know that's you don't see that often from from a leader we're so obsessed with having that image of a powerful leader who who, who must lead and be strong but there are different ways of doing it and i think um she's really showed that yeah actually there's another thing i might want to mention really that um i do some work um with the college of policing as a, a sort of subject matter expert in, in media with them mm-hmm. and it's really interesting to see how the police in particular are trying to change their language um on social media because in the past certainly when i was a young journalist if you went to ask a police officer uh, for, for a story as a journalist it was i'm sorry young man that's on a need to know basis and you don't need to know there was there was not a lot of um not a lot of human interaction w- w- with the police at that time and mm-hmm. they their messaging was very uh, staccato, very, very straight and, and quite, you know, quite boring in its own way. Now they're trying to understand what their audience is and who they are. Uh, and to give you an example, but perhaps of how empathy can work, if you look, if you look back to, to the, the, the fire at Grenfell, there was some horrible situations at the, after that in which people were taking photographs of dead bodies, mm. which has become, unfortunately, something that happens quite a lot after Nazi incidents and, um, and, and bombings and, and attacks. Mm. It's very strange, but it's, it's uh, often you'll find members of the public trying to take pictures afterwards. And on that occasion, the police intervened and they, they got the, the, the person, the perpetrator, uh, and they actually gave him a prison sentence, or the courts gave him a prison sentence after he was arrested. But since then, they've tried to change tack a little bit. And more recently, they simply used uh, a, a message on social media that when somebody took a photograph of, of, of bodies, they said, how would you feel if that was your daughter in the photograph? Mm. Please don't do it. Mm. And that simple message, which just caught the public's mood, was so impactful that they didn't have any more problems with, with, with that issue in that, in, in that event. Um, so it's amazing how just getting the right message sometimes and connecting with people can help people change people behavior just as much as wagging a finger can. Yeah. Yeah. So finally, I just want to come back perhaps to a slightly more general question, which would be, I mean, why should you talk to the media in the first place? Is it worth putting your head above the parapet effectively? Well, I think talking to a lot of our, our, our clients at the moment and, and talking to businesses around the region, um, a lot of people say in a crisis, the most important thing you should do is communicate, communicate, communicate. Uh, and I think that's a really good thing to consider at this time because um, a lot of businesses are not able to, 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 to be with their customers. Not, a lot of them are not even able to open, but they are still able to communicate. They can still talk, remind people they're there. Um, and I think you know, that's one of the key things of keeping your business going at this really difficult time. 
you know, I think maybe a, a company that's really showing that is Brighton and Hove Albion Football Club, mm. um, which are, you know, they've, they've been some, they've some, done some very impressive work over the last um, month or so. For instance, they they are holding weekly press conferences online, so that they're still talking to people to the media. They're ringing their supporters to talk to them and offer an offer and offer support. They're holding um, on online forums for supporter groups and the same for staff. Um, so they've basically made a decision. The chief executive there, Paul Barber, that they want to communicate, 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 and keep on going. And that's something that's that's bringing them a lot of warmth in 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 response because people appreciate the fact that they're still talking. Um, and I think you could definitely replicate that at, at countries across the country who who want to make sure that they're still there mm. when when we when the lockdown finishes. So one uh, top tip or a, a key takeaway for our audience today, Chris, perhaps from our conversation today, what might it be? Yeah, I, I have to go back to that empathy thing because I think you know if, if you are going to be the person that's going to be representing your business in an, in, an, in a media interview in the future, or if you're ever going to be lucky enough to do. Uh, a televised interview really you need to remember to be a human being and to remember why you're doing the interview and what you want to achieve from it so for instance you know a lot of people think all I need to do in this interview is get through it without making an idiot of myself Mm. I just need to get through it but that completely (laughs) destroys the reason why they're doing it in the first place because they're doing it to connect with other people to talk to potential customers to build the profile of their business and really, the best way to do that is to be a human being, to understand who you're talking to and how they might receive your messages and to just build that skill of being able to communicate with people. Chris Hatherall of Midnight PR, thanks so much for coming on. How can our listeners find out more about you and uh, Midnight PR? Yeah, well, they can go to our website, which is midnight.co.uk. Uh, and they can also find us on Twitter at Midnight Comms, and that's capital M and capital C for comms, but only one M. And uh, we, we'd love to hear from them. Fantastic. Well, thanks, Chris. And thanks for listening, listeners. I nearly said viewers then, listeners. The show notes are the going to be in the usual place, sitevisibility.co.uk slash IM podcast. I would encourage our listeners to leave a review for enjoying the show because that shows appreciation. It helps us to get out to more people. If you've got questions and suggestions for future topics, then the email is podcast at sitevisibility.co.uk. You can tweet at sitevisibility. We have a site visibility group on LinkedIn. So that's all from me, Andy. And it's all from Chris. Yes, just stay well and keep communicating. Thanks, Chris. And we'll see you next time on Internet Marketing.